Well, what we're going to do for the Lord, we better do it quickly because I believe that time is running out. Amen. I believe you would all agree with me. It looks that we are living in the last days. It looks as if Jesus could come at any moment and time is of essence. Jesus said we better work while it is yet light for soon darkness is coming when no man can work. And I think what we're going to do, we better be about it quickly. Sort of reminds me of a story I heard about about this man. He went to see his doctor, and the doctor examined him. He said, sir, I hate to tell you, but you have an incurable illness. You're dying. He said, at best, you have about six months or less left to live. Well, you can imagine this man was stunned. He was taken back. And he said, well, doc, that's pretty tough. He said, isn't there any hope you can give me any, anything that you can do? Isn't there anything at all you can do to help me? And the doctor said, uh, well, there is one thing. He said, uh, move to Alabama. He said, marry a widow woman that has about 16 children, has a hog farm with about 150 head of hogs on it. Well, the man was real puzzled. He said, well, doc, he said, will that help me live any longer? And the doctor said, no, but it'll be the longest six months you ever live. <laughs> <laughs> so time is running out. What we're going to do, we better do it. Amen? Amen? Turn with me tonight in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 14. I want us to begin reading tonight with verse number 15. And read down through verse 24. The text tonight is a familiar one. You'll recognize it immediately. It is a parable that Jesus gave. It is a parable of the great supper. And I want to preach tonight on this subject. Come to supper. Come to supper. Stand with me tonight as we read God's word. Beginning in Luke chapter 14 and verse number 15. And when one of them sat at meat with him, heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade or invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first <clears throat> said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways, and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. You may be seated. Some time ago my wife and I were walking through a department store there in Warner Robins. We ran into some people that we knew and we stood and talked for a few moments. And as we were departing, they said something like this. They said, now y'all come see us sometime and we'll have a meal. You know what they meant by that? Nothing. <laughs> That's a figure of speech here in the South, right? Y'all come see us sometime means absolutely nothing. Now, if we'd showed up, they'd probably had a stroke. They'd had to run out and get paper plates and paper cups. They were just trying to be nice. That's something we all say from time to time. Y'all just drop in and see us sometime. Doesn't mean a thing. But several weeks later, we were somewhere else. Walked into another store and we ran into another couple that we knew. 
And they said something like this. They said, now we'd like for you to come this Thursday night, promptly at 6 o'clock. We're going to grill big, thick, juicy steaks. We're going to have a salad and a big old baked potato. And we're going to have homemade peach ice cream. Can you make it? I said, sir, I've just cleared my calendar. I promise you, I'll be there. <laughs> you know, all of us like to receive invitations, don't we? We like for someone to phone us or write us or send us an invitation. Well, here in this story that I read tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling a story about a man who prepared a large feast and a large banquet. He sent out the invitations far and wide to everyone, and he invited them to this wonderful, exciting, and thrilling feast. Now this story illustrates the kingdom of God, salvation, getting saved, going to heaven. I want you to look at this story with me tonight, and I want you to note three things with me. First of all, I notice in this story there was a supper. Now the Lord Jesus Christ was a master preacher, a master illustrator of all the things He could have used to illustrate the wonders of His mercy and of His grace. He used the illustration here of a banquet or a feast or a supper. Now I noticed three things about that supper. I noticed first of all that it was festive. There was laughter in the air. There was a smile on everyone's face. The air was electric with excitement and anticipation and joy. Everyone was thrilled and bubbling over. Everyone was just delighted to be there. You know, salvation is like that. When you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not a dry and a dull affair. It's the most wonderful, thrilling, exciting thing that you can ever do in your life. When Christ comes to live in your life, it is the beginning of joy and gladness and peace and happiness. So many people walk around today with a frown on their face. Looks like they've been eating spaghetti out of a vase. They're walking around miserable and defeated. And they give impetus to this idea that being a Christian is a dry and a dull affair fair. Far from the truth tonight. When you come to Jesus, it's the beginning of joy. It's the beginning of Amen. gladness in your life. Amen. Well, not only was this supper festive, but it was inclusive. When this man made the guest list, he sent out the invitations far and wide. Everyone was invited. No one was omitted. You know, I'm glad tonight that I can stand on this platform and say that I am preaching a whosoever will may come gospel. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. The good yeah. news tonight, God says, all are invited, all may come. Jesus died for every last person on this planet tonight. Everyone is invited to come to God's table. Praise Praise right. Well, not only was this supper festive, not only was it inclusive, but I noticed this about it tonight. It was expensive. When this man put this thing together, I don't think he ran down to Walmart and got paper plates and paper cups. I don't think he got a pack of hot dogs and some day old bread. I think he was very lavish in his provision. He went out and got the best food and the best drink. He got out nice, beautiful white linen tablecloths, candelabras and candles in those candelabras. Man, everything was just as nice and as lavish and as expensive as it could be. He did the very best that he could to put this thing together. I want to tell you, when God chose to save you and me from our sins as unlovely, unworthy, undeserving sinners, He did the very best that He could his own dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, left the beauties of heaven, came to this earth, walked up Golgotha's hill, shed his red royal ruby blood, and died on Calvary's cross so that you and I could be saved. God did the very best that he could. This supper was expensive. It cost God a lot to save you and me. It cost him the blood of his own dear son. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, not only was this was there a supper, but I noticed the second thing in this story tonight. <coughs> There was also a servant. Now God needs servants today. I don't know how it is in the free will Baptist church, but I know how it is there's some Southern Baptists here tonight like me. I know how it is in the Southern Baptist church. When somebody walks down our aisle, the preacher usually grabs them by the hand and says, sit down and fill out a card. And they've been sitting ever since. They thought that was the Great Commission. They're like a tree planted by rivers of water. I shall not be moved. They've been sitting there for 45 years, got their name on that pew. You couldn't move them with a stick of dynamite. But God needs some servants. Amen. 
When you get saved, you didn't get saved to sit on a pew and fossilize all your life. God saved you to work. God saved you to serve. God saved you to be a witness. God saved you to do something. And here in this story, we see a man who was a willing servant. Well, let me show you two things about this servant. First of all, this servant had a message. What was his message? Look down in verse 17. Come, for all things are now ready. Men, don't you like it when you get home in the afternoon and it's sitting on the table hot, ready to go? Amen. The tea has already been poured. The biscuits are coming out of the oven. Not the kind you walk on the counter, but the real kind that are made by hand. Amen. Glory. <laughs> Some time ago, my wife had fixed a nice meal on a Saturday afternoon. And I was doing what most men in America do on a Saturday. I was laying on the sofa in a semi-conscious state watching a ball game. Well, she came around the corner and she said, It's ready. Well, I just kept laying there like I was ready to be embalmed. I mean, rigor mortis had already about set in. A few more moments, she came around the corner again. She said, all right, it's ready. Come on, let's eat. Well, I just kept laying there. I was watching the Hoodows play the Billy Goats, man. I wasn't moving. And finally, in a few more moments, she came around the corner. She began to shake me violently. All right, get up. Come on, it's hot. It's ready. It's, it's all sitting on the table. I noted a note of urgency in her voice. And folks, we have lost that kind of urgency in the church today in sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like taking something hot out of the oven. We need to get out of here tonight and go into the highways and hedges and share the gospel with every last person. We need to tell them God's got a table set. And on that table there's some bowls of mercy and forgiveness. There's some dishes of salvation and grace. There are some luscious layer cakes of mercy and pardon and forgiveness. Everything is there. Everything is ready. All God says tonight is come on I've got the table set. Amen. Amen. A servant with a message. But then I see not only did that servant have a message but he had a method. What was his method? Well if you look down further in the text he went into the streets. He went into the lanes. He went into the highways. He went to the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. He went everywhere to everyone in every way that he could, sharing the gospel. This lady came up to me one time and she was very indignant. She said, I don't like your method of evangelism. I said, What's yours? She said, I don't have one. I said, I like mine better. <laughs> Whatever your method of evangelism is tonight, it better be one of going. God has commanded this church and every one of us who are saved to get out of here and go into the highways and go into the hedges. There's a world tonight that's lost and dying and going to hell. And we have the life-changing message of the gospel tonight. The world needs to hear the good news that Jesus saves. We need to have a message. Come for all things are now ready. We need to have a method, one of going. God says to you tonight, get up and get out of here and get up off your blessed assurance and go and share the gospel of the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, not only was there a supper which was festive and inclusive and expensive, not only was there a servant who had a message, come for all things are now ready, and a method, one of going, but now here's the heart of the message tonight. Here's where I wanted to get to. Not only was there a supper, not only was there a servant, but number three, there were some silly excuses. Now I call them silly because that's exactly what they were. Yeah. Listen to the excuses that were given here in this text for not coming to this banquet which represents salvation. The first one said, I have, verse 19, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. Well let me back up. The first one there in verse 18 he said, I uh, yeah, he said, I've gone to buy oxen. Bought a piece of ground. Thank you, Pastor. Lost my verse there. Went out to buy, buy a piece of ground. Now, here's what most Bible scholars tell us. These banquets and these feasts that they had, they were not in the middle of the day. Now, you somebody said they were having homecoming Sunday. Homecoming and dinner on the grounds. I've been to a million of those things. 
Enough chicken to feed five National Guard units. <laughs> but now, in Jesus' day, in Jesus' time, these banquets were not in the middle of the day, but they were at night when it was pitch black dark. How many of you would go out in the middle of the night when it was pitch black dark buy a hundred acres of land? Let me see your hand. Would you go and buy an automobile in the middle of the night? Would you go out and make a major purchase in the middle of the night when it's dark? Man, nobody goes out and buys something in the middle of the night when it's pitch black dark. But now, let's get to that next guy. He said, I've gone and I bought five yoke of oxen. I need to go and prove them. Now, riding over here every night, I've seen some of those big John Deere tractors. I saw one the other day. Things got lights all over it. These guys nowadays can get out there at 1, 2, and 3 in the morning, flip one switch, and a bar of lights will come on in that tractor. It'll light up the field like a football stadium. They can plow a row as straight as an arrow. But now I don't think these oxen had the headlights on, do you? <laughs> I don't think you could plow too straight a row with a team of oxen in the middle of the night. But now this next guy, I like him. I can relate to him. Verse number 20. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now think about this. Here's a guy who is a newlywed. He's just gotten married. He's been invited to a banquet, and he says, no, this poor girl probably didn't know how to boil water. <laughs> Several years ago, I was in a revival in the state of Tennessee, up in the hills of Tennessee. And I was staying with a pastor who was a dear friend of mine. We had gone to... Bible college and seminary together. We were good friends for many years. And every meal, every meal, his wife prepared. We got up every morning. We didn't have a bowl of cereal or a Pop-Tart. I mean, we had eggs and grits and bacon and toast every morning. Then he and I would go out during the day and make some visits and we'd come in at lunch. We didn't have sandwiches and a few chips. Every day we'd come in, she'd have meat and she'd have several vegetables and she'd have bread. She'd have a nice dessert. Then we'd get out there and we'd go hustle and visit, work all afternoon. We'd come back in at night just before the revival and there would be no leftovers, but many times a, another big spread. She, she did that every day, day after day after day. I mean, the poor thing worked herself down. The last day of the revival. We were all sitting around the pastor's home. I, I was over there on the, uh, an easy chair sitting there kind of taking it easy. His wife was laying on the sofa. Both eyes were closed. I said to myself, he's killed the poor thing. He's working to death this week. <laughs> she hadn't had a break. She's probably, she's probably over there and she's probably uh, about to go if she hadn't already gone. Well, a few moments later, <clears throat> the telephone rang. It was the chairman of deacons in that church. Brother Pastor, I've heard that your wife has been working and slaving and fixing good meals all week long. I imagine she's pretty tired. Listen, he said, there's a new seafood restaurant in town. Got an all-you-can-eat seafood buffet. I'm going to come over in a little while, get you and the evangelist and your family, take you all down there. We're going to all eat a nice meal, and I'm going to pay for it. You know what that crazy preacher said? Oh, no, brother. He said, my wife is about to get up in just a minute and start the evening meal. Well, I would feel there where she was laying on the sofa and I saw one eye pop open. <laughs> All of a sudden, a resurrection occurred. <laughs> she got up off that sofa. She cleared the coffee table. I mean, she set a new high jump record. She went sailing across the living room, grabbed that phone out of his hand. He's lost his mind. We'll be ready in about 10 minutes. Come on over. <laughs> Hung up the phone. Any woman that I know anything about, well, oh, I'd rather go out to eat, right, ladies? <laughs> Amen. Amen. In fact, you know, most Baptist churches, we, we'll vote on most things, won't we? Let's, let's vote here tonight. How many of you women here tonight would prefer to go out to eat versus stay at home and slave up? Put your hand up tonight. Man, I'm telling you, fellas, you better get your pocketbook out. I'm going to hurt tonight. 
All these excuses were so ridiculous. I'm going out here in the middle of the night to look at land. I'm going out here to plow a team of oxen. My wife, who doesn't know how to boil water, is gonna, not going to go to this wonderful bank. But how foolish and how silly these excuses were. But folks, again, this is talking about salvation. And men and women and boys and girls who are lost without Christ make excuses and give alibis for not being saved. I've heard them all. You've heard them all. I want to give you tonight some of the excuses that I have bumped into over the years as a preacher. Now granted, I've been a pastor for 15 years. I was an evangelist for 15, 16 years. I've preached over 400 revivals in 18 different states. I am no expert. I'm not a know-it-all. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I've heard a lot of excuses. Let me give you some excuses that I've bumped into. Well, here's the first and the greatest one. Well, I would go down to that church and get saved, but there are just too many what down there? <laughs> Hypocrites. <laughs> well, I always tell them, hey, we got room for one more. Come on down and join us. <laughs> then I always tell them I'd rather go to church and go to hell with them. Amen? <laughs> then I always tell them this. Jesus handpicked 12 men being the all-wise, all-knowing Son of God, knowing when He picked them that one of them was a devil, one of them was an imposter, one of them was a fake, one of them was the biggest hypocrite that ever walked on this planet, Judas Iscariot, and Jesus knew it when He picked him. And that says to me, if Jesus had hypocrites, don't you think we're going to have them too? Don't let some hypocrite stand between you and Almighty God. Come to the house of God and give your heart to Jesus and live for God. Don't get your eyes on some phony hypocrite. Amen. <laughs> Here's another one I've heard a lot over the years. Well, I would get saved, but I'm too young. You know, we make two mistakes in most churches today in regards to dealing with children about salvation and their eternal soul. I see it happen all the time. Here's the two mistakes we make. Number one, sometimes an evangelist, I tried never to do this, but sometimes preachers will do it. Sometimes we're overzealous. Sometimes in an order to report to people, we've had a lot of people saved and give statistics and numbers and say, look what we've done. We'll do anything and everything to get them down the aisle. Hey, it's not my job to get people down the aisle. Amen. It's the work of the Holy Spirit of God to convict Amen. men and call men and bring them to Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. Amen. Sometimes we're overzealous. But then sometimes we're overprotective. I had a woman tell me this one night. It broke my heart. She said when my little boy was about eight years old, he was under conviction. His hands were trembling and the tears were running off his cheeks and he was trying to get by me to get down there to go and tell the preacher that he wanted to be saved. And she said, I stepped in front of him and said, you're not young, you're not old enough yet. You don't know what you're doing. And she said, I pushed him back into his seat. She said, Preacher, he's 45 years old now and he's in a penitentiary. He's in there doing a life sentence. He's been a rebel against God all his life. And she said, My boy is probably going to wind up in hell and his blood is going to be on my hands. God forgive me. If God's working in their heart, get out of the way and let him come. Amen. Amen. You're not smarter than God. God knows what he's doing. Amen. Well, here's another excuse I've heard. The converse of that one, I'm too old. Well, there is a great danger, I will admit tonight, in putting off salvation. For every 100 people that graduate from high school without getting saved, 80 of them will die lost and will never get saved. For every person who reaches his 30th birthday without getting saved, one out of a thousand ever gets saved. The statistics tonight are so undeniably clear. The best time to come, the best time to get saved is while you're young, while your heart is sensitive, while you're tender, while you are pliable and receptive to the gospel. Imagine what could have happened if Adolf Hitler had gotten saved as a young boy. Imagine what could have happened if uh, Stalin and Khrushchev and all these other men in history had gotten saved as little boys. History would be different tonight if they'd heard the gospel and been saved at a young age. But I want to say tonight it is never too late to come to Jesus. Amen. 
There is a danger of your heart getting hard and your heart getting tabbed. But as long as you're sensitive and as long as you're open and as long as you're receptive to the gospel, you can be saved. Several years ago, I was out in the state of Oklahoma preaching revival. A man came down the aisle one night to get saved who was 99 years of age. His best friend brought him down the aisle tonight, that night. He had been witnessing to him, praying for him for over 65 years. And I, I jokingly said to people on about the 15th stanza of just as I am, those two fellas finally got down to the front of the church. It took them that long to get down there. They were both so old and feeble. But thank God that old boy got saved that night at 99. Amen. It's never too late to come to Jesus. Well, here's another excuse I bump into a lot. Well, preacher, I'm pretty good. I, I don't think I, I need to get saved. Why? I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't chew. I don't even run around with those that do. Well, let me tell you something tonight. The Bible says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. As good as you are tonight, you're not good enough. And God says you'll die lost and go to hell without the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care if you're the best person in Taylor County tonight. Without Jesus Christ, you'll split hell wide open. Amen. Amen. Well, here's another one tonight. Well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. I'm pretty bad. Well, you know, I preached in jails and prisons for a number of years when I was just beginning in the, in the ministry. The, one of the first people I ever led the Lord in my life was a condemned murderer on death row. He killed people. I was talking to a man the other day. He said, Preacher, I was in Vietnam. I had 54 confirmed kills. Killed 54 of the enemy while I was over there. He said, Can God save a man if he's killed somebody? I said, He sure can. Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarsus, had been a murderer, but he became a missionary. He had been a persecutor, but he became a preacher. He was the greatest enemy of Christ, but he became the greatest emissary of Christ. I don't care who you are or what you've done tonight. The grace of God is greater than all our sin. The Bible says He's able to say to the uttermost, all that call come unto God by Him. And I don't like what one preacher said. He said He's able to say to the guttermost. Amen. Amen. Well, I could go on tonight till about midnight, I really could, giving you excuses. But I want to just give you one more tonight because this one is the greatest, the most used excuse of all. Somebody is sitting here tonight lost and you're making this excuse right now. I know I need to get saved, preacher. I know I need to walk down that aisle. I know I need to give my heart to Jesus. I'm not ready. I'll do it later. I'll do it on my time and my terms. No, you won't either. You'll do it when God is ready. Amen. Jesus said, no man comes unto me unless the Spirit of God draws him. Right. And here's the truth of the Gospel tonight. While God is calling and drawing and knocking at your heart's door tonight, He may not call and draw and knock tomorrow night. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Amen. Call upon Him while He is near. Yes, yes. <laughs> Many years ago, I preached a little church, a little town in northwest Florida. This girl, I remember her name that night. I've got her name in the back of an old Bible at home. Her name was Sue Story. Sue was about a 17, 18-year-old girl that night. And she came forward and gave her heart and life to Jesus. Many, many years later, I was back in that area preaching another revival. And I looked up and I saw this lady coming toward me. And man, when she was coming at me, she looked like a linebacker for the Green Bay Packers. I mean, I braced myself. When she got to me, she just grabbed me and picked me up off the floor and spun me around about three times and kissed me on the cheek. And she said, oh, preacher, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. you do you remember me? And I thought, no, but I ought to. <laughs> Then she told me her name. As soon as she told me her name, I said, yes, ma'am, I remember. You're Sue's mother. I remember when Sue got saved. I remember the night Sue gave her heart to Jesus in that revival. So good to see you. Thank you for reminding me of that. How is Sue doing? All of a sudden, that big smile was gone and the tears just started pouring down her face. She said, oh, preacher, about a year ago, 
she was leaving the place where she worked one afternoon. Driving down the road, it was just a torrential downpour. Couldn't see your hand in front of your face, and she was trying to make it down those roads, going to pick up her little girl at a daycare center after work that day. And she said as she was driving down the road, she lost control of her automobile and veered over into the other lane, and an oncoming log truck just ran into her and ran over the top of her and crushed her and killed her. And that woman just fell on top of me and began to sob. And she said, oh, thank God, preacher. Oh, thank God that you came. Thank God that you preached. And thank God that my daughter got saved. What about you tonight? God's saying to you tonight, come. He's got a table ready. What excuse are you going to make tonight? Come to Jesus and be saved.